The Unwanted, Chapter 8, Part 2 The military truck did not leave its base until almost 9 o'clock. Thanks to Mrs. Tam's emphatic recommendation, we experienced no problem embarking. The soldiers pulled us up into the back compartment as the truck prepared to leave Saigon. About 40 men were squeezed tightly together in a small area, but they left generous room for my family on one bench against the far end of the truck. We moved together to our seats, trying to occupy as little space as possible. I sat on Luan's lap while my brother cuddled up between my grandparents. Next to them, in a corner, my mother hid herself in a shadow, clutching her abdomen. The soldiers smiled to welcome us. Their uniforms were stained with sweat and dirt, as if they had not been washed for months. Many of them sat with their buttocks against their calves on the floor, since there were not enough seats. They stared at my brother and me with curiosity. I looked back at them and smiled. The trip to Nha Trang took more than eight hours. Two-thirds of the way, I drowsed in the arms of a soldier. He played with my curly hair, telling me about his family in the north. He had a little brother on crutches that he had not seen in over five years. Pay attention, little guy. I am going to teach you something, he said with enthusiasm, looking at my mother for permission. She recoiled further into her seat without looking directly at him. I am going to recite to you the teachings of Uncle Holt. It is for all of the children in the South, and it tells of five rules. Are you ready? His eyebrows raised to show his excitement. I asked him, who is Uncle Holt? Uh-oh, wait a second, little boy. A surprised look flooded his face as he pulled me closer to him. Who is Uncle Ho? Why, he is Uncle Ho Chi Minh, our savior, our supreme president. His legend spreads far and wide to many nations in the world. And just by his name alone came the destruction of the shackle that for many years enslaved our people to the evil Americans and to the phony Vietnamese Republican government. How could you be so unenlightened, little guy? My mother mumbled a hasty apology for my ignorance. The soldier nodded as if to express his forgiveness and continued on with his lecture. The first rule is, he began, love thy country, love thy neighbors. Lying in his arms and listening to his voice, I thought of a similar experience that I had had on the beach of Nha Trang. Back then, the soldier had been an American who had occupied a military base near my house. One day, when I was playing outside with some of my classmates, a voice called out in a foreign tongue, beckoning the children to come closer. On the other side of the barbed wire, I could see a soldier with a red face and sun-bleached blonde hair. He held up a handful of candies, which he used as bait for our company. I came closer to him as my friends hesitated. Kian, they shouted to me, come back. Unlike the rest of the children, I was not in the least frightened of the foreigner in front of me. Having attended my mother's parties, I had had plenty of experience with strange people and understood some of their funny language. I took a step closer to the fence. Hello, little fellow. Want some candies? The American soldier asked in English. I noticed a tint of gray in his icy eyes. I nodded. He gestured for me to come closer, which I did. Through the barrier, I accepted his gift. Nice little fellow, he asked. Do you know how to blow bubblegum? Again, I nodded. He ran out of the base to the other side of the barbed wire and joined me. My friend stayed away, observing every move we made. The soldier ignored my classmate's aversion as he turned and waved at them. Don't you want to share some candies with your friends? He suggested. I shrugged. He laughed and ruffled my head. I brought him closer to my classmates, and the candies I had in my hand overcame their fears. We spent an afternoon playing with the soldier on the sandy beach while the sea murmured at our feet. Before we separated at the end of the afternoon, he asked, Can I see you and your friends again tomorrow, little fellow? I nodded and ran away, catching up with my friends. 
The next day, unable to convince any of my classmates to accompany me, I returned to the beach alone. My new friend stood under the coconut tree, holding a plastic bag full of chocolate and colorful wrappers. I ran toward him. He picked me up and threw me in the air, then caught me before I fell to the ground. I took the soldier to my home and showed him to my grandparents. Upon meeting them at the doorstop, he took off his helmet and bowed his head to salute them, the way Vietnamese people pay respect to their elders. My grandmother made us some lemonade while we sat by the pool. For hours, the soldier lay on the grass, folding up yesterday's newspaper into boats that I floated on the pool's smooth surface. At one point, I looked up to see him propped on one side, staring into the air. Hello, American. You okay? I waved a hand in front of his face. Okay, he replied, his eyes squinted under the sun. I am just homesick. You understand, homesick. I miss my family. Family? Oh, yes, I know. You have pictures? I asked him. Yes. He perked up. Do you want to see my family? He reached into his back pocket for his wallet. My family, I repeated after him with my broken English, holding the worn pictures in my hands. Some of them had dark creases as they had absorbed his perspiration. No, my family, he said, correcting my poor English, not your family. One by one, he showed me his loved ones. He told me he was from Wisconsin. To me, the name Wisconsin was as strange as the color of his eyes. His parents looked amiable and soft as they squinted at the camera. He also had an older sister who had just gotten married. The wedding picture showed a beautiful woman and her husband laughing on a church's front steps. The bouquet of white roses in her hands matched her dress and veil on her blonde hair. The same picture also showed his younger brother, who was about my age. You remind me of my brother, you know, he said, touching my hair. Yeah, good, I said. Uh-huh, his name is Todd. He is a very good boy, sort of like you, very skinny. I miss him very much. He touched his brother's face in the photograph with the tips of his fingers. Yesterday, before I met you by the beach, remember, I was on the phone with Todd. It was his birthday, but I didn't get a chance to sing him happy birthday. He was leaving for summer camp. Anyhow, when I walked outside feeling depressed, I saw you running on the sand with your bare feet. You look just like a little American boy, you know? I was so happy to meet you. In a way, being with you was like spending time with Todd, except that he talks a lot more than you do. I said nothing. Thank you, he said suddenly. For what? For everything, for this lemonade, for being my little friend, for making this place not so alien as it was two days ago. Great. Then see you tomorrow? No, I can't. I'm leaving tomorrow for combat. I won't be back until a week from Friday. A week from Friday. I calculated loudly with my fingers. Ten days? Yep. Will you come back to the beach then and wait for me, he asked. Sure. No sweat. I marked each day with a scratch on my bedroom wall. On the tenth day, I ran back to the military base, but the spot under the coconut tree was empty. The afternoon went by as I sat alone in the sand, waiting for the soldier to return. It was not until the sun dove into the ocean and my grandmother called me for dinner that I realized he would not be coming. The next day, I returned to the camp, only to be disappointed once again. A week later, while in the middle of hide-and-seek, I saw a military truck parked in front of the soldier's base. Its cargo area was piled high with coarse bags made from ponchos, most of them darkened with dried blood. Something prompted me to go closer. As I ran to the truck, the intent look on my face must have convinced the American soldiers to allow me to climb aboard. As though I were dreaming, I reached out for one bag in particular buried deep under the heap. As I touched it, the zipper gave way under my hand, and from the darkness within, a familiar shock of blonde hair tumbled out. In my trance, I wondered why I had never asked my friend to tell me his name. Unable to find the courage to rezip his body bag, I jumped from the truck and ran back home.
at the doorsteps of my house, I remembered that the soldier had never known my name either. Now a few years had passed. The Americans were gone. My family was fleeing to a life of danger and uncertainty. And another soldier was reciting Uncle Ho's rules to me. And the fourth rule is, take good care of thine own hygiene. Lying half asleep in his embrace, I looked up and saw on his face the same expression I saw on countless lonely faces every day. It was the homesick look of children who were lost in the chaos of warfare, witnessing death and disaster, longing for a meaningful touch.